time for our journal jazz as I'm moving my chair up here, my stool. And uh, yes, it's been a while. It's been a while. So I'm still working on my third uh, signature here. This was the last page, which was over a month ago. Uh, today I'm going to do a double uh, spread page. So I've already um, taped, you know how they're in one inside of another. I've already taped this so I can work on both pages. So we'll do it like, take it out like that, close this up, put that here. And um, I've been thinking about this page for the last few days. And this is going to be um, something that's uh, very personal and something that I usually do not talk about um, to people other than uh, no one knows about it except for my family and close friends and um, all of you guys now. But I want to talk about it because it has become such a widespread problem. I'm going to talk about opiate addiction. And, I mean, it's all you hear about now. There are so many people affected by opiate addiction. And people are dying every day. And um, I had a long, long uh, period in my life where I was addicted to opiates. Uh, fortunately, that is long gone now. Um, my addiction started in the very early 90s. Um, always the trailblazer. I like to get out in front of things, so <laughs> I became addicted to opiates before it was a really big problem. Um, but the reason I'm going to talk about it today is because if any of you all have um, issues with this or no, have friends or family members, it seems like just about everyone does, um, you know, maybe, I'm certainly not an expert, um, I just have my own experiences and experiences of, of other people that I've talked to. Uh, but, you know, if I can, if I say something that might be meaningful to someone, good. But I think it's an important subject. It's a really big problem, and it is not an easy one to solve. It's, I can't express how terrible it is. So I'm going to, uh, <laughs> what a great introduction. I'm going to really bring you guys down today while I'm doing this. <laughs> no, I'll try not to be too depressing. But let me grab some paint and uh, we'll start the page. Okay, I want to, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna tape some paper behind here so that I protect uh, this page. Um, anyway, I, um, most people, or, or, or a lot of people, not necessarily, you know, young teenagers, but other people that um, are introduced to opiates. A lot of times it happens through your doctor. When I was in my early 20s, um, I worked for a company and I had dental insurance. So I decided to start getting all of this uh, dental work. Well, first I had... Uh, my wisdom teeth. I had to have my wisdom teeth out. They started uh, on one side, my wisdom tooth started hurting. And so went to the dentist to have my wisdom teeth removed. And he gave me a prescription for Vicodin when I left there. I think he gave me like 20 Vicodins. And I loved this dentist. I just loved him because, excuse me, I'm walking away for a minute to look for um, a brush here or a sponge brush. Uh, I love this dentist because I 
really um, have a big fear of dentist and this guy would put you to sleep um, while he was uh, doing whatever he was doing. I mean, literally put you out with an IV. So it was great. You'd wake up and everything's done and, you know, it really um, helped me because I had just a debilitating fear of the dentist. Um, so after he did that to take my wisdom teeth out, I thought, you know, this is, this will be a great opportunity to get a lot of this dental work done that things that, you know, I needed done. I, I had a, a, well, who cares what I had? I had a little chipped tooth in the back from biting down on something once. I had a couple fillings I needed. Anyway, I decided, you know, I'm going to get all this work done. But when I left the first time, he had given me like 20 Vicodins. I had never taken any kind of narcotic pain medication before. And I wasn't even going to take it, but then I guess the next day it started bothering me. And I figured, well, I'll take one. And before, you kn before I knew it, I'm running around cleaning my house, doing things that I'd been putting off for months, and really enjoying it. And it didn't really occur to me at first that it was the pill that was giving me all of this energy. There are some people that when they take narcotic pain medication, it makes them really tired, even nauseous. Uh, they want to go immediately to bed. But then there are other people like me and like a lot of people who have a tendency uh, towards addiction. It does the opposite. It makes you feel great gives you tremendous energy, and um, it's just um, a good time because it's not like, you know, a high feeling like you're drunk or you've been smoking pot or something like that. You just feel really, uh, really together, uh, really on. Um, anyway, so the next day I got up took another one. For 10 days, I, I would take one every day. And then, of course, I took the other 10 in five days because I started taking them two a day. Because uh, the thing about narcotic pain medication is you get used to it really quickly and uh, you need more. So I went back to the dentist, he's doing work on my teeth, he gave me another prescription, and this went on for several months. And this guy, I don't think he was a drug pusher, it was just way before it became a thing. You know, I don't know if they realized that there was a problem with addiction uh, back then. So they prescribed very easily. And I remember one time, um, I ran out of them before I went back to get the neck for my next appointment and I was out of them for a couple days and I became very agitated and when I went to see him I asked him I said you know I've been so agitated and felt really terrible the last couple days I said do you think I'm getting addicted to these no Cindy that's ridiculous you can't get addicted you know just taking one or two of these a day no certainly you can't but anyway, I finished getting my uh, teeth fixed, the prescription stopped, and that was it. Moved on, forgot about it, everything was fine. Let's let this dry, and I'll be right back. Okay, my gesso is, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty much dry here. Um, so I'm going to start with, I'm going to use some acrylic inks. FW De La Rowney and some India ink, um, Dr. P.H. Martin's Bombay. And just uh, start working on the background. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. So, um, all of my dental work was over and I forgot about the uh, pain pills and about a year went by, but I, I started having these debilitating headaches it felt like a knife was stabbing into the top of my head all the time it was just terrible and I went around and had all different kinds of tests and um, they couldn't uh, 
I just didn't really get to the bottom of that for a long time, but I did find doctors that would prescribe Percocet for the pain. So I started taking uh, Percocet all the time. And of course, really liked it. And um, just got into the habit really of, um, you know, taking it every day. Then 1996, I believe it was right around there, um, OxyContin came out. That became uh, quite the popular drug, and um, I think it's Purdue Pharma is the company that makes that. And they did a major, major marketing campaign, and they had all of the doctors prescribing that, and they prescribed it in um, 20 milligram pills, which is like taking four Percocets at a time, uh, 40 milligrams, like taking eight Percocets at a time, and 80 milligrams. I don't think, I think finally they had to, I, can, I have to pour this a little bit, whoops, that's probably not good. Um, I think they finally had to take the 80s off the market because that was just a little much. And, you know, in the early 2000s, they were starting to see that, you know, there was becoming a problem with addiction uh, with the OxyContin. But, uh... Once I started with that, uh, it, it was all over. I mean, I just, uh, whoops, spilling stuff. I loved it. I was getting it from the doctor. And, of course, you get to the point where, you know, you can't get enough from the doctor. But there were always tons of people that um, are willing to sell their OxyContin as a way to make money. Um you know, usually people without a lot of means and, you know, it's just, it's a way for them to survive. And uh, I don't judge them at all. I mean, they're doing, you know, <laughs> what, they, what they can do. Uh, but once you become addicted to the OxyContin, and you're taking, you know, 20 to, I mean, not 20, 10 to 15 of those 40 milligrams a day, there's no such thing as, you know, oh, let's just say no. I'm going to quit today. I'm just not going to do it anymore. That just, uh, that isn't realistic. It's impossible because uh, even to go a day without it, um, you can't go to work. I mean, because... You know, they'll say, oh, well, if you're going through withdrawal, you'll have flu-like symptoms. Well, I'll tell you, I've never had a flu that felt like that. I mean, it's just, it, it's horrible, you know, how sick you can become. Uh, chills, seizures, uh, it's just, it, it's really bad. And, and that, I think, a lot of people do not understand... Um, and it frustrates a lot of people when they're trying to help, you know, a family member, um, you know, get away from the opiate addiction. It, it's hard for people who've never done it before to understand just how terrible you feel. And when you're doing it, you know... It's easy to go to work, and you're motivated to go to work. And I can tell you, and I'm not proud of this, but um, to this day, the year that my most successful year as far as uh, you know, gross income was also my probably worst year of addiction. Um, And, you know, that's, it's, it's pretty pathetic. I mean, it's just, it, it's sad. Um, 
and it's not something that you can really talk to people about uh, because you know it's it's embarrassing when you're dependent upon um, a drug to be able to literally get out of bed in the morning um, you know I was fortunate in that um, I was pretty much self-employed so I didn't have to worry about drug tests or anything like that I don't know what people do when they're in that situation you know maybe that's a good thing because it prevents them from getting themselves that far you know down the uh, rabbit hole or whatever you want to say and I was also fortunate that even though it really, really um, creates a strain on you financially because you can never buy, you can never, a doctor's never going to prescribe enough to support the habit that you, you have over, you know, a time. Because you build up your tolerance and you need more and more and the doctor's not going to increase you that much. So you have to end up buying it from other sources. Like I said, people that uh, you know sell their own because they don't take it or they don't take that much. And it's very expensive. Because these people that sell it know that people will, uh, you know, <laughs> you charge what the market will bear and people will pay just about anything. If you're feeling sick, you'll pay just about anything to feel better. And um, so you can really get yourself into a, a terrible financial situation. And I thank God that even though, you know, it did create a lot of financial issues, but I was never, uh, I always made enough money so that I never had to resort to um, really terrible things to support my habit because I have heard some really really sad stories of things that people things that women have um, had to do to to not be sick I mean it, it's it's really terrible and and there's a whole industry of people that will uh, try to you know, they say they're trying to help you, um, you know, get off of the opiates. And I have heard some really terrible stories about women that have been taken advantage of because they wanted so badly to treat their addiction and, and then just were horribly taken advantage of. And, um, you know, one woman I talked to, it was just, it, it was pathetic. She almost lost her life. Um, you know, over something that she had saved money for. She had saved money for this treatment for two years, and she was so happy when she was finally able to go get it. And, um, you know, she, she almost died because it ended up just being a, a horrible man and, a, you know, a scam. It was just, you know, that's another thing is people think, oh, you know, can take it easily take advantage of people that are addicted to uh drugs okay now I have this all over the place I'm gonna let this dry a little bit then I'm gonna come back and do some stenciling I'll be right back okay now this is all dry and I'm gonna do a little um, spraying through some stencils you guys ever notice look at these stencils I use the same ones I have millions of stencils and I use the same ones all the time I don't know why. Well, I get. I I know why. I, I love these stencils. But uh, I need to start trying some different ones. Anyway, back to the story. So what happens over time with your addiction is you become the drug really of steals your soul you become so inside yourself 
um, or at least I did, and I've heard a lot of other people say the same thing. I didn't want to go anywhere. Um, I didn't care about relationships um, anymore. Um, you become... Um, there's a real lack of motivation that happens. I don't know if this spray is going to work. And you sort of, I mean, you notice it, it's happening, but you make excuses for it. Um, most opiate addicts do not deny the fact that they're addicted because, you know, if you have a brain at all, it becomes very obvious. I mean, if you're sick, if you don't take a drug, then you're obviously addicted to it. But, you know, most people can't just drop everything and go to rehab. And I don't know that 12-step rehabs, um, I think they work for some people and they don't work for other people. Um, I'll tell you how I it, it got um, started moving past my addiction in 2000, I think it was 2003, I just, I got to the point where I, I knew, I knew I had to do something. I could not continue living my life this way. It cost a lot of money and I was just, I wasn't happy. So I was doing a lot of research on different kinds of uh, treatments. They They have what's called a rapid detox treatment where they put you in the hospital and they um, basically do the Narcan thing on you, which is what they do when somebody's overdosing. And they even have a treatment where they'll put an implant in, although I've never heard anything good about that implant. Uh, but they put that in and that immediately takes all of the opiate out of your body. So they say you're no longer physically addicted to it. You're just mentally addicted after that. Well, um, I, I don't know about that because I've heard that, you know, after a couple days, people do start uh, craving it again. And I think that would, you know, probably work along with other medications. But the way, what I decided to do, and a lot of people do not think this is a good idea, just like me spraying this color, which looks just like all these other colors, not a good idea to do. <laughs> but I went the methadone route. And a lot of people, um, you know, don't like the methadone route because they say you're trading one drug for another. Um, and it's true. You are. You're trading one addictive drug for another. The difference is when you go on the methadone, you have to go to a methadone clinic where they're monitoring you. And when you first start, you have to go there every day for several weeks and then they'll let you come every other day and then two times a week and then eventually you work your way up to once a month. And they drug test you all the time. So if other drugs show up in your system, uh, they have the ability to kick you out of the program or take you back to the first stage or whatever they want to do. But what methadone does is it normalizes your life almost immediately. Because all of a sudden, you're not feeling, you know, the high from the opiate, but you're not getting sick. And you can, uh, and you're not having to worry about where your next pain pill is coming from. So it immediately relieves that stress from your life, worrying about not having drugs. And for me, it just totally normalized my life. You know, I took my 
uh, one dose of the methadone every day and uh, got used to that and everything you know pretty much got back to normal um, I didn't feel like a junkie anymore I wasn't uh, alienated from everyone anymore uh, I was taking a drug that was uh, that was legal. It was my prescription. I was taking the dosage that I was supposed to take, and it worked really well. Now, the goal with methadone is to go on it, get everything straightened out in your life, and then start, they start, the clinic starts weaning you off of it. But most clinics uh, pretty much leave it to you as to when you start weaning off of it. And that's the problem is some people never do. Some people stay on methadone their whole lives. Um, but usually most people get tired of it. Now, the one thing that I, I think methadone is a really valid remedy for adults that have hit rock bottom. Um, I think for anybody that wants to get off drugs, you have to be at the point that's rock bottom for you. And rock bottom is different for everybody. I know I felt like I was at rock bottom. I felt like I just had to do something. And methadone was my way out. Now, I've seen children, though. Um, actually, let me dry this real quick, and I'll be right back. Okay, this is pretty much dry. Uh-oh. Oh, here it is. Let me use this. And I didn't see it. Um, this is a, what is this? Crafters Workshop stencil. And it's number 355. <clears throat> and I'm going to use it here a little bit. But anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah. Kids. I used to see parents uh, bring their children into not little kids but teenagers into uh, the methadone clinic and that always made me so sad because you just knew it wasn't going to work because you could tell the kids did not want to be there this was totally their uh, parents idea because their parents were grasping at straws they probably tried everything else they could think of and now they were going to try this but unless you've hit rock bottom and really want to uh, solve your drug problem you're probably not going to do it. And, and children, um, you know, they don't have as much to lose. You know, people, adults, they may lose their children. They may lose their uh, marriages, their home, their job, their money, their self-respect. Um... But kids, you know, that are still living at home and they, they don't have, they haven't lost enough yet to realize how badly it's really hurting them. So I would see kids come in there, but I don't know the stats, but I would say a large percentage of them probably went, you know, right back to uh, taking other drugs um, unbeknownst to their parents. But, you know, for adults who have really made a decision to make a change and have really lost a lot and realize how important it is for them to get a grip on this before they ruin them, their lives anymore, I think methadone can really work. 
Uh, the trick, of course, is to not stay too long. Um, you know, it, it may take a year or two, but, you know, don't get too comfortable at the methadone clinic and stay too long because it is also very difficult to get off of methadone. Um, I think that most people, um, let's see how am I going to go with this? Eh, let's just keep going. Um, I think it's important if you have a really bad opiate habit to um, go with some kind of medical program. Um, you know, you'll meet the occasional person who goes off cold turkey, who, you know, lays in bed for a couple weeks, you know, sweating and throwing up and shaking and having seizures and, you know, makes their way through it. But, you know, it can also be dangerous. There have been people who um, have died uh, during opi opiate withdrawal. So I think it's best to be under a doctor's care so that the doctor can give you other medications to ease your symptoms, whether it be, you know, Valium or Xanax or some kind of tranquilizer or something that can help you sleep at night. Uh, because insomnia is one of the worst things when you're trying to withdraw. You literally cannot go to sleep. And, uh, you know, something to help you with the nausea and the pain. But, you know, obviously with the doctor overseeing it so that you don't end up becoming addicted to something else. Okay. Can you see what I've done here? I have two women and then one's behind them. And this is going to be indicative of my journey in and out <laughs> of opiate addiction. It's very dramatic, Cindy. Okay. Um, but yeah, you know, th that's the frustrating thing, too. I'm going to turn on this light, and hopefully it won't cause too much glare, is it? I don't know. J just until it gets a little bit lighter out outside. Um... But yeah, it's what's so frustrating for family members and friends is that, you know, you cannot make somebody uh, quit doing drugs. Uh, drug users are liars. They're going to lie to you about it. And, um, and the person has to want to quit. Um, you, unless you want to, unless you're ready, um, it's going to be very difficult um, for it to be successful. You know, most adults who have been opiate addicts for uh, a long, long time, you know, will admit it. And most of them, I don't think I've ever met one that didn't want to quit. They all want to quit. Nobody wants to be chained to a drug. I mean, it's not that much fun. It is in the beginning, but after years, it... <laughs> It's not fun anymore. It's just something that you have to do to be able to function, to take care of your children. I can't even imagine what it's like for um, mothers who are addicted to opiates, and there are a lot of them. I mean, you, how impossible would that be to try to go through drug treatment, try to withdraw when you have little children? that you have to take care of 24-7. I mean, there's just so much involved in, um, in solving this program. I'm solving this program. I mean, solving this epidemic. Um, it, it's not, you know, just a one remedy type thing. I mean, there's daycare involved. There's, you know, health care. There's, you know, mental health care. Um, so much involved with it, and it's only going to get worse, and we saw it coming. And I'm going to get a little political, but not really political. 
this is about the company that makes OxyContin. They knew this was coming. They knew it was coming, and they wanted it to happen. Uh, don't try to sue me, Purdue Pharma. I don't have any money. But they knew it was going to happen. I mean, they saw it happening. They were pounding the doors of the doctors uh, for several years, you know, giving them all kinds of, you know, bonuses and trips and all kinds of free stuff to prescribe that medication that they knew was highly addictive. They knew it was only supposed to be prescribed for extreme pain, but they were telling doctors that, no, you can prescribe it for minor pain. You can prescribe it for this. This is okay. It's great. Blah, blah, blah. No, it was bad. I mean, that doesn't mean that the users are not responsible, but, you know, that, that was uh, pretty insidious of that corporation. Let me grab some black paint. I'll be right back. Okay, I have a little bit of gesso here. And I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna do this, but I'm just gonna start covering this uh, second one here with some gesso. Um, but if, if I had a friend today that was addicted to opiates and they were really ready to do something about it and they ask what I thought, I would probably tell them to look into, uh, to find a doc doctor who, um, who treats opiate addiction with um, Suboxone or buprenorphine. I'm not sure what the difference is between those, but both of those are drugs that supposedly are not addictive like methadone, but work similarly to methadone. You take them for a certain amount of time and um, they help you through the cravings and the side effects and uh, give you some space to get your life back together. So that's probably what I would suggest. I, I, don't, I don't know how well 12-step uh, programs um, work for opiate addiction. I haven't really heard, I mean, well, I've, I've heard a lot of people say that they don't, that they're not as successful as they are with alcoholism or other kind of drug addiction, uh, cocaine addiction, something like that. But I've heard that they're not, you know, that successful with opiate addiction, but I don't know. Don't take my word for it. Everybody is different. Uh, for me, the methadone worked. I definitely spent too long on the program. If I had it to do over again, I would not have stayed so long. But ultimately, I got uh, out of it. And uh, am I the same person as I was before I was addicted to opiates? Absolutely not. No, I'm a totally... Not totally, but I'm a different person now. When you go through something so traumatic, and it is traumatic, being a drug addict and uh, getting away from drugs, it changes you. And I feel for anybody struggling with that, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. In fact... Uh, when I heard that Rush Limbaugh was a bad uh, OxyContin addict, as much as I dislike, you know, his rude, arrogant ways, I felt terrible for him. I don't even wish that on Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> no, I felt I felt horrible for him because no one should have to go through that, and. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It's just, it, it's an easy thing 
to get caught up in and for some people it's especially easy and I don't know if it's um, genetic I do have um, addiction in my family not my immediate family but my grandmother had really bad arthritis and uh, she was addicted we didn't realize it at the time but she was addicted to Percodan oh gosh probably for 10-15 years up until she passed away and I can remember her you know uh, begging for it and we'd say no it's not time it's not time and she's yes it is yes it is you forgot to give me my last one <laughs> But, uh, you know, I know now, I mean, she just was suffering. So, you know, maybe it, it's genetic. Uh, like I said earlier, there's some people that, you know, try a narcotic pain medication and they just hate it. Makes them sick and makes them very tired. And then, then other people, it makes you feel great. And uh, so if you ever take one, it makes you feel great. Be careful. Be careful. Try to stay away from that second one. <laughs> it's very hard for me to talk when I'm trying to stay within the lines. As you can tell, this uh, the spray is bleeding, but that's okay because I wanted color in here. I wanted color, but I wanted it to be different from the ones at the ends that are totally colorful. You know, and the really bad thing about this is that so many people, and this did not happen to me, but it's happening to a lot of people now, and especially a lot of young people, because doctors have gotten, you know, a little bit stricter about prescribing the opiates, you know, people will start on opiates and then there's not as easy access to them, so they turn to um, heroin so that they don't become ill. And that's just, um, you know, I knew when I was... Uh, a drug addict you know I, I, I knew that there was no difference between me and a junkie I mean obviously you know I had a home and you know <laughs> uh, a job and things like that but as far as uh, the need for the drug and the addiction I mean there, there there's no difference and now people are uh, you know, turning to heroin because it's a lot uh, cheaper. And they say, I don't know, I've never tried it. Uh, they say that it's very, very similar. It feels very similar to the, uh, the OxyContin. Well, you know, OxyContin was invented... Um, to try to help with heroin addiction, <laughs> surprisingly enough, because the Bayer Aspirin Company invented heroin a long time ago as a painkiller. And then after a while, they realized that it was, uh, they were having an addiction problem with it. And this was back in the, uh, I thought this was the 1800s. I guess 1800s. And uh, so they came up with oxycodone to, uh, to give people instead of the heroin because they thought it was less addictive. And they really didn't have a problem with it until uh, Purdue Pharma started that major OxyContin uh, campaign and it became prescribed um, like candy with the doctors
But yeah, people especially like, you know, in Appalachia, West Virginia, um, Tennessee, Kentucky, I mean, they have a huge, huge heroin problem now uh, because of their OxyContin problem. You know, that's why they have so many people out of work uh, because people are not able to uh, pass drug tests. You know, I read something. You know, there was the big um, natural gas boom in West Virginia. I know about this because my family's from West Virginia. But the big natural gas boom. And it was supposed to really help the people of West Virginia helped the economy, the natural gas that they were uh, um, getting out of the mountains there. But it really didn't end up helping uh, the actual citizens of West Virginia very much because they had to bring in, most of these large companies had to bring in uh, employees from out of state they weren't hiring people from West Virginia and they said uh, one of the largest uh, gas companies did an interview the CEO and he said it was because they could not find um, people from West Virginia that could pass the drug test because of all the opiate addiction I mean that's really really sad you know, and whole families are, are being destroyed when you have a parent that's, you know, a drug addict. You know, what kind of life are you providing for your child? You know, it's likely that they're going to grow up with addiction problems or learning problems or who knows what else. Okay, now this one in the middle, I'm going to do really dark. I'd be curious to know, um, any of you guys from um, outside of the U.S., if, um, let me get this brush a little wet, um, if you're having the same issues in your com uh, country with the opiate addiction, you know, is it just a, uh, you know, this huge problem in the United States or is it worldwide? Of course, I could Google that. But if any of you guys want to tell me, feel free to just tell me. <laughs> so I guess everybody's probably getting ready for the holidays. And you all are probably making art as gifts. I know I am. Everyone in my family, except for my mother and father, they get gift cards because that's what they want. Uh, but everybody else knows that they're going to be receiving art from me, whether they like it or not. And there's a couple of them that I don't think are really crazy about it, but. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Yeah, I'm not going to do another uh, art show or festival until um, after Christmas. Probably the beginning of the year. Unless, unless I happen upon one that's inexpensive and would be easy to set up and do. Okay. So here's my people. This is Cindy before she was a drug addict. And this is me slowly sinking in 
losing my soul into addiction. And here I am coming out of it. This is me now. Okay. Now I've got to do something with this up here. I'll wash off my brush. Let me let this dry a little bit and I'll be right back. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, cover this with gesso up here. I'm probably going to have to do several coats because this is going to bleed through too. But I'll just keep <clears throat> going over it. Um, I was finished with my talking about opiate addiction, but I just remembered I didn't tell you how um, I got off the, uh, the methadone finally. Um, so in case any of you know anyone in that situation, I should mention that. Um, with that, they will, uh, when you tell them that you want to start weaning off, that you want to get off the methadone, they put you on a schedule and they take you down. And I'm one of those people, I can't stand anybody controlling me. And that's a problem that a lot of, uh, people with addiction tendencies have. So I did not tell them. Um, naturally this was risky, um, for me to do on my own because I could cheat and they would never know. But at that point I wanted it so badly. I was so ready to, you know, move on from that part of my life. I'd already, you know, I've moved on from the Oxycontin to the methadone, which had helped me a lot, but I was ready to, you know, get out of that part of my life too. So I did it on my own and uh, I just started, I, I withdrew very, very slowly because I had a real fear. I already knew what, you know, withdrawal symptoms feel like and I was very afraid of that. So I withdrew uh, over several months and I was withdrawing in the beginning at like lowering it uh, five milligrams a day. And I started, uh, it was at a hundred milligrams, which probably doesn't mean anything to any of you, but I was at a hundred and I started withdrawing five milligrams. And I think I just said a day, but no, it wasn't a day. It was uh, like a week, <laughs> five milligrams a week. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and sometimes I, I would, you know, I wouldn't do the five less for a whole week. I, I'd do five less for three or four days until that felt okay. And then I'd go down another five. So I just started lowering it very quickly like that. And when you, when you, uh, wean yourself off so slowly you really don't feel anything until you get down to uh once you get down to you know maybe 20 milligrams then you'll start feeling little side effects but it's not bad you know you're not throwing up it's you know you may have some issues with sleep um but you could take something for that um, so it really, it wasn't that bad. And even when you start feeling them a little bit, you've already committed to it for so long. You're so into doing it. By that time, you're, you're almost in a hurry to get to the end. So you don't want to backslide at that time, or at least I didn't. And I think most people are that way. Um, so that's the way I did it. I did not do it by the book but I did do it successfully. So I just wanted to mention that so that I'm getting the whole story out there. And oh yes, this is gonna take several coats. Come on, a little bit, a little bit. And I'm not gonna bore you doing all of these coats on the camera. Just finish up this little bit and then I'll turn it off and put a few more coats on and get it to the uh, the whiteness that I want and then come back and do some some decorating. Yeah, 
you know, maybe with this, um, I doubt it because it doesn't appear that they've put any money into this. Um, I guess people were trying to get this declared as a national emergency so that more money could be put into uh, mental health and addiction treatment. Um, from what I understand, um, the government did not declare it as a national emergency. They declared it as something else, which basically means, okay, we're going to say it's important, but we're not going to put any more money into it. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, how that's going to turn out. You know, hopefully they'll change their minds on that and realize, you know, that something needs to be done. Um, there, there needs to be a variety of different um, addiction programs because, like I was saying, not everyone is the same. Um, not everyone is going to respond to the same sort of treatment. So it's always nice to have options. And uh, like I said, you can't make anybody want to uh, quit drugs. Well, I mean, they have to want to quit, but, you know, if it's someone in your family, you probably can help to I don't know how to articulate this, um, but sort of help them to want to quit without it being something that they feel like, you know, they're forced to do, that someone's making them do. But if you can, you know, help them reach that decision on their own, that's probably the best thing that you could do. And of course, you know, be supportive. And trust me, I know it is probably really, really aggravating for someone who's not an addict, never had addiction problems, to understand why would somebody do this to themselves? You know, why can't they see what's wrong and just fix it? Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's the way people think. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you. It's a tough one, and I feel like, you know, I can do most anything. If I want to do something, I do it. Um, a couple years ago, I couldn't paint. Still not great at it, but, you know, <laughs> I'm doing it, and I'm making videos of it, whether people like it or not. Um, but that uh, that opiate addiction thing, that was, that was a tough one for me. That was... Uh, by far the hardest thing I've ever done and probably the hardest thing I'll ever do. And okay, I'm going to turn off the camera now. I'm going to let this dry and I'm going to keep making it whiter and then I'll be back. This is funny. As I was um, <clears throat> trying to lighten up the back there, I realized that I did these wrong. So I'm going to try to fix it here. I didn't do this little line. So it makes it look like she has a really um, fat face or no neck or I don't know what it looks like, but let's fix them. that. Flip it over. Let's see. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. That's better. And then I'll just put some little white in here. But right now I'm going to let's see. Do a little whoops. This isn't completely dry. I'll do it anyway. Look at how short my uh, charcoal pencil is. I think it's time. There we go. Give a little shading like that. turned off my overhead light and of course now my natural light is getting cloudy outside again hope you can see never fails As you can see, I'm kind of hurrying through this because I tend to make these uh, Art Journal Jazz videos way, way too long. I'll do that and then I I cut out where are they oh here they are I cut out a couple little tiny hearts that I want to glue on get my Mod Podge here This is to indicate that the beginning and at the end, I had a heart. <laughs> I actually had a heart in the middle too, but as I said, it uh, kind of steals your soul and And just make some, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's not that you're not caring, but it just creates a kind of numbness inside of you. Okay. Let's, of course, do my favorite thing. You have to make dots. little dots and this is indicating energy and light and it's coming over here and boom all of a sudden I get it back again and it is amazing how quickly you get it back when you get all of those other toxins out of your body all of a sudden you know you want to do things again and see people again and communicate and experience different things all the things that you were missing and, and didn't even real, realize that you were missing
Okay. Let's see. It's kind of wet around here, so I can't do the charcoal. Let me try to go around it with a pen. Because I don't want to really ruin my brand new pen, and I'm going to do that, aren't I? Yes. Yeah, I go through these pens like crazy. Okay. And let me get some words and I'll be right back. You know, usually I would stamp, but I think I'm just gonna write this. I think I'm gonna write. Just not wanting to write very well. Out of Darkness. I don't know what's stopping that. Out of darkness. What is this? Is it not dry? Okay, let me get a different pen. Hold on here, I'll be back. Okay, use a Sharpie. into the light. Out of darkness, we'll make a little arrow, just in case someone doesn't get it. <laughs> Into the light. Okay, let me get my tag. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Rip my little tag in half. November 15th, 2017. We're getting near the end of the year. And let's see, where do I want to put it? Right. Sorry about that. My camera went off. Anyway, put it right here. Do I have a staple? And I do. Things are looking up. Get this out. And that's it. That's my art journal jazz page that will go in my art journal. And uh, yeah, I can't believe that uh, I told you guys about something really personal, but I just felt the need to because I hear so much about it <clears throat> on TV and on the radio and online. I know a lot of people are struggling with this and um, I feel for you. Um, but just know whether it's you or a friend or someone in your family, you or they can come out of it. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. You can get over it and I'm living proof and until next time, peace.